From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. While well, our attention was consumed over the weekend with that Chinese spy balloon building right after it's being shot down by a military aircraft off the coast of South Carolina. Yesterday, this is what President Biden had to say about that operation. On Wednesday, when I was briefed on the balloon, I ordered the Pentagon to shoot it down on Wednesday as soon as possible. They decided without doing damage to anyone on, on the ground. They decided that the best time to do that was if it got over water outside within our within 12 mile limit. It successfully took it down. We're joined now by Nick Wadhams, who leads our national security coverage in Washington. Nick, thanks for being here. Uh, one question I have is, do we know when we knew about the balloon? He talked about Wednesday. Is that the first time we knew the balloon was up there? Well, there's a, the question is when Joe Biden knew about the balloon. Uh, the, uh, U.S. intelligence and, and NORAD knew about the balloon uh, a few days before that. They had been tracking it off the coast of Alaska and then down uh, with Canada, through Canada. And then uh, once it became clear that this was an unusual situation, the balloon was lingering a lot longer than past uh, balloons had and was also hovering over some sensitive military sites, particularly those Minuteman three silos in Montana. That's when it came, went up to the president. Uh, and so there's a lot of second guessing by Republicans right now about why he took so long. Is there any doubt that, in fact, it was the military that said, let's wait until it's all out over the Atlantic Ocean? Well, we're, we're still trying to figure out the exact uh, details about how this whole process happened. I mean, what the administration is saying is that, yes, the president wanted to take down that balloon, as, as he said there, and the military advised, well, you know, we can neutralize this thing. We can take care of its intelligence gathering capabilities, uh, so it's not going to pose a threat in terms of what, what information it's collecting. So let's just avoid all risk and make sure that it's over water when we decide to take it down. Uh, obviously, uh, we're still trying to figure out if that is, in fact, the case. Uh, Republicans have been extremely critical of the president for not doing so earlier, but that, that is currently the narrative that the administration is putting out. Okay, Nick, thank you so very much. That's Nick Wadhams reporting from Washington. And now we turn to somebody who was responsible for the defense of the United States of America, William Cohen. He's chairman and CEO of the Cohen Group. He served as Secretary of Defense under President Clinton after 18 years in the Senate representing Maine. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being here. Give us your best estimate about whether this was a significant intelligence risk for the United States. Uh, I don't think we knew uh, in the beginning, and that's why uh, the question you ask, uh, when did we, what did we know and when did we know it, was really key uh, in this regard. When the president was finally advised, was the, did the military indicate to him that it posed no threat, either physical threat, because uh, we had to determine what was on the balloon or what might have been in the balloon, uh, when did they determine it posed no threat? Did they determine they could intercept the communications that were coming from the uh, equipment on the balloon? Uh, were, was there a link to uh, satellite communication back uh, to Beijing? Uh, when did they decide that they could uh, interfere or uh, collect that information so that it wasn't a threat to the United States? I think uh, President Biden acted what I would call presidential. Uh, he uh, uh, wanted the thing to come down, uh, the balloon to come down, but the military said, let's do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize our citizens. And frankly, had he ordered it down in the military, against the military's advice, and it came down and injured or killed some Americans on the ground, uh, they would have been the first out to criticize him for acting uh, in an irrational, irresponsible fashion. Mr. Secretary, I'm curious, at least, I wonder if you know why we have balloons gathering intelligence, given the fact we have satellites. Do they do something satellites can't do? It feels a little bit 19th century to me. Uh, it is pretty uh, low cost and low capability, except uh, when they're flying at lower levels like that. And as uh, your previous guest indicated, uh, they can linger. They can loiter. They can hang over the Minuteman base uh, facilities uh, for hours. 
they may be able to get more granularity uh, in terms of what they're looking at. They may be trying to get communications between those who are running those facilities, what kind of alert status they're on, what are they saying to each other, and trying to at least uh, build a profile of those individuals uh, and uh, and uh, have factor that into their uh, their computers uh, going forward. Uh, Lieutenant General Hurtling uh, of the United States uh, made an interesting interesting observation. He said it may be they have floated this in an effort to see uh, how we would react to it. In other words, how many agencies are involved? How quickly were the agencies able to establish communication with each other? What were they saying to each other? What was the reaction uh, on, on the part of the American citizens on the ground, et cetera? So all of that could have been an intelligence gathering uh, mechanism uh, by the, the Chinese. I don't think it was by accident that it came here. Uh, it raises another issue for me. I don't want to take <laughs> too much time, but you know, why didn't the Chinese alert the United States once they discovered it was coming, uh, being blown off course? Pick up the phone. I, uh, when I was Secretary of Defense in 1997, first thing I uh, requested was let's have a hotline between my office and counterpart in China. So if something happens, we pick up the phone and we can talk to each other. When the Chinese discovered this was going off course, if it was. Why didn't they pick up the phone or why didn't they answer the phone if we called them to say, hey, you got a problem here. We may be forced to take this down. We want to maybe do it in a way that we're going to analyze everything you've got here, but we should be talking about this. Secretary Curry, you took us exactly where I was going to go, which is what does this incident, do you think, tell us about the overall relationship between the United States and China? We know back in the Soviet Union days, it was critically important, even when we were at daggers drawn, to have communication so we didn't have mistakes being made. And mm -hmm. I wonder about that. I thought in the wake of the EP3 situation that we'd improve those communications with China, at least at the military level. We always have to keep in touch with a power like Ch uh, China, or indeed Russia. We have two nuclear powers. Uh, China presents a bigger threat uh, these days, given its capability, its size, its manpower, and its technology. So the notion that we're just going to play like we're, uh, uh, we're cowboys and shooting uh, our handguns or rifles up in the air at Chinese uh, obstacles uh, I think it's kind of irresponsible, and I don't believe if the Republicans were in charge at this particular point in the White House, they would have done it any differently if the recommendation from the military was, say, let's take it down under our terms and not jeopardize the American people. Mr. Secretary, as you say, it's possible this was a probe, essentially, to test our defenses and how we would react to that situation. Uh, but I wonder whether, in fact, we're confident that President Xi himself was behind it. There was an incident, you remember, with Bob Gates back in 2011, where he was over there visiting with Hu Jintao, and they tested a stealth aircraft, and it at least looked like the civilians didn't know about what the military was doing. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, I was in Singapore with uh, Secretary Gates at the same time, uh, and the uh, Chinese uh, canceled uh, the meeting that was uh, about to take place. So I'm familiar with uh, how they react uh, to uh, various uh, uh, confrontations and situations. Um, I, I think we don't know enough right now. I would suspect that, you know, it's been suggested it could be a rogue operation. I wrote a novel at one point years ago about a rogue operation in China. But President Xi has pretty much uh, uh, installed everybody that he wants. And I doubt very much where anyone, rogue or otherwise, would take any action that he wasn't aware of. So it's another uh, question. It's a mystery. We don't know the answer to it. Hopefully, we'll find out. Secretary Cohen, uh, from what you know, having run the Defense Department at this point, uh, would there be occasion to rethink some of our defense posture in light of this? Or do you think we reacted the right way and maybe we don't need to rethink it? Uh, I think we always have to uh, analyze where we are with uh, with the Chinese, with the Russians, and other countries. There was a report from a uh, general most recently. He said we should be prepared to go to war in two years. Um, number one, I think that's a bit uh, aggressive in terms of saying we are going to war. We don't have to. It's not inevitable. But secondly, we could go to war tomorrow or the next day or next year. There's no specific time. If we don't handle this relationship right, we could end up doing something thoroughly stupid, or they could. And suddenly we're in a war which is cold, turning hot. 
And I think that's what we are determined to avoid. We need to have diplomacy. We need to take into account their capabilities and our own capabilities and sit down and say, are there three or four areas that we can agree upon? We're always going to have this tension, this competition. You are a rising power. We're an existing power. In the past, that hasn't worked out too well because in most cases, the uh, led to war. We have to learn from the past how we avoid war because we have too much catastrophic capability to destroy the planet if we get it wrong. We heard from Senator Rubio, the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee yesterday on TV, saying that basically this is because Pre President Xi thinks the United States is weak. We're on the way down. Given our response here, do you think that would reinforce that thought in President Xi's mind or actually dissuade him? I think the weakest thing about us is what's taking place uh, in Congress and in the country. Uh, we are a deeply divided country. And when we're this deeply divided, that gives an opportunity for the Chinese, the Russians, and any other country to take advantage of our division, to exacerbate them, to prey upon them, to divide us by race, religion, ethnicity, economic uh, status. I think the biggest uh, weakness that we show, and this is what the Chinese and the Russians are looking at, that we are weak from within, that we are undermining our capability. And that's why President Biden is trying to say, we're back. And we're back with our allies. And our allies have proven when you show leadership, America, we're with you in Ukraine. Uh, we have bonded together in ways we haven't in many, many years. So it comes to leadership, and it also comes to followership. And what's happening in this country is that we are eating away at our own institutions, our own credibility, our own reputation to the rest of the world. That's what's weak about this country. Very powerfully said. Thank you so much. We really benefit from hearing from you. That's William Cohen. He's chairman and CEO of the Cohen Group. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the spy balloon fiasco from the Chinese point of view with former U.S. Ambassador Tu China, Gary Locke. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West. And we've talked with Se Secretary Cohen, the former defense secretary, about the point of view of the U.S. military with respect to this spy balloon. Let's talk about it from the Chinese perspective now to, with somebody who knows China terribly well, Gary Locke. He's the former U.S. ambassador to China, former secretary of commerce, and former governor of the state of Washington. Ambassador Locke is now president of Bellevue College. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being here. Uh, let me be clear. You're American. You're not Chinese. So I'm not qualifying you as an expert, a Chinese. Chinese expert. But at the same time, you do know the regime over there fairly well. What do you make of this whole incident? Well, I think they're very embarrassed by this, and it has really set back uh, U.S.-China relations. Uh, after the uh, President Biden and President Xi met a few months ago, uh, there was a, uh, you know kind of a thawing of the relationship, and you had Secretary Bl Blinken about to visit China, uh, the first uh, Secretary of State visit to China in about five years. And so people were really looking forward to these high-level talks just to begin uh, constructive dialogue, uh, knowing that we have major differences between the United States and China over human rights, its military uh, ambitions, uh, Taiwan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But still, we have so many areas in which China and the United States must work together, such as stopping uh, North Korea from developing a nuclear weapon. Uh, so it, I think this was a huge blunder by the Chinese, and there may be some repercussions uh, that will that will follow. And it will probably be a while before we really have an understanding, a better understanding of what happened. Maybe we'll never understand. But it does strike me that of the two alternatives, that it was a mistake on the Chinese part, or they did it intentionally, I'm not sure which is the worst answer in terms of U.S.-Chinese relations. Well, obviously, the impact is still the same, and Secretary Blinken had to cancel the trip. This actually reminds me of, of the uh, uh, the U-2 incident between the United States and Russia back in 1960, uh, when Gary Powers, uh, flying that U-2 at 80,000 feet, was shot down by a Russian missile. Uh, the United States at that time claimed, oh, he was simply on a weather reconnaissance a trip. Uh, but once the uh, remnants of the airplane and the, the spyware was uh, retrieved, uh, then it the United States had to admit that he was on an intelligence a spying reconnaissance a trip, very much the same way that the Chinese had to say uh, this was simply a weather balloon. But we know it wasn't. We know it wasn't. And let me just say that as a former governor, I applaud the administration's decision not to shoot it down over land. 
I mean, when you're talking about equipment the size of three buses, uh, and and as we saw uh, when they shot it down over the water, a debris field over seven miles. As a governor, I'd be very worried that that debris could have uh, struck a residential area, uh, uh, commercial area, injured or killed people. Uh, I thought it was a great idea to shoot it down over shallow water so that you could actually retrieve some of the pieces. Had they shot it down over land and it had come plummeting down uh, onto fields, uh, onto buildings, it would the, the pieces would have been uh, 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 demolished into smithereens, into millions of pieces. Here, at least uh, in, in shallow water, they're able to retrieve it and hopefully uh, gain sizable pieces and analyze it. Mr. Messer, I just got a question from a viewer that I think is a good one, goes to a larger issue. The question specifically is, given the Chinese structure, as you understand it, the command and control, could they have launched this balloon without President Xi knowing it, knowing there was a risk it would go across the continental United States? And that more largely raises the question, is there a question about the command and control structure over in, Xi, in, in China? Well, so many of these things are, are going on on a daily basis because the Chinese have uh, many of these balloons uh, uh, doing reconnaissance all around the world. And, and normally they, uh, these balloons, uh, except for maybe Taiwan, uh, don't fly over countries but come very close to the, to the borders of these countries. And so this balloon, uh, as we found out in the past uh, during the Trump administration, had flown very close to U.S. territory, maybe come in and out and then... Uh, just briefly into U.S. territory and then gone out. Uh, what happened on this one, why it uh, uh, veered so far into the heartland of the United States, perhaps the Chinese did not intend it. President Xi did not know about it uh, until it was too late. And then uh, who knows what the decision-making process was within uh, the political uh, structure of China at that point. As you know, initially, the Chinese government was almost apologetic about what was going on, and then they really turned course and became much more aggressive in their response now, really decrying the fact that the United States shot it down. And the one thing we do know, I think, is that the Chinese government is really uh, allowing, permitting, maybe encouraging communication about this within China itself. What does that tell us about the, the political value to this for President Xi within China? Well, obviously, they're first embarrassed by it, and they have to try to save face. And so they're going to say uh, it was a weather balloon, and there was no need for the United States to overreact. Um, number two, uh, they then said, well, you shot our balloon down. We reserve the right to do the same thing if the United States sends a balloon or does any similar act. Well, we don't fly our airplanes uh, over Chinese territory. We don't use balloons. Uh, both countries, in fact, most sophisticated countries around the world now use very high altitude satellites. They spy on us, we spy on them, we spy on Russia uh, and everyone else with, uh, mis with satellite capability is watching each other. So finally, Mr. Ambassador, uh, mindful of the fact that you were our ambassador over in Beijing, uh, what do we do next? Uh, because there was a concern that the relations between the United States and China had really been deteriorating. We need to get them back on track to some extent, if for no other reason than for military communication back and forth so we don't make a mistake. How can we, how can we recover from this so that we have at least a, a relationship where we're communicating with each other? Well, I, I, I think you'll see um, communications resume and high-level meetings resume. It may take a few months. We have to let this incident uh, uh, pass, pass over. Uh, there was no way that the Secretary Blinken could go to China on the heels of this so soon. So uh, there'll be have to be a cooling down period. And, uh, you know, we have domestic politics that we have to worry about, the sniping between uh, the Republicans in the administration. Um, more information will come out about uh, the decision, uh, the recommendations by the military. Uh, we'll have a better idea of what was retrieved. Uh, and um, then we'll move on from that. Uh, so finally, this may be unfair, what advice would you have for President Biden as he stands up before the joint session of Congress tomorrow night in dealing with China? Obviously, he has to address this, I would dare say. At the same time, he has to be careful that it doesn't get too hot, does he not? Because there are people in that chamber, frankly, some Democrats as well as Republicans, who are really quick to react on China. Well, obviously, uh, we have a major competition going on with China. Uh, over cybersecurity, intellectual property, uh, development of semiconductors, and of course, protecting our national security interest and making sure that the secrets of America, whether by our military, our government, or private sector, um, our technology firms are not stolen uh, by, uh, by Chinese hackers or, or by Russian hackers. 
And so uh, we need to really look at this from how do we position ourselves to be even stronger. As Secretary of Defense Cohen talked about, we need to really um, um, improve our stature in the world. And that means that we need to really focus on the challenges within America. How do we rebuild America? How do we make our country stronger as a manufacturing uh, entity in uh, semiconductor research, in, in science, scientific technology, and the list goes on and on. So I think the president in his State of the Union address tomorrow will be talking about the challenges that China poses in terms of what we as a country need to do to be strong. Mr. Ambassador, always a pleasure to have you on. Really helpful. That's Gary Locke. He's the former U.S. ambassador to China. Still to come, we're going to get the latest on Ukraine from former NATO Deputy Secretary General Rose Gautamuller. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. President Joe Biden delivers the State of the Union address. Join David Weston and Bloomberg's top political reporters and analysts live from the Bloomberg headquarters in Washington, D.C. As President Biden lays out his plans to tackle the war in Ukraine, Congress's debt limit standoff, immigration, and more. And stay tuned after the speech as we break down the Republican response. Special coverage starts at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, simulcast on television and radio. Only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television Radio. I'm David Weston. It's now time to figure out what is going on in the markets with so many geopolitics, but also some earnings news and a lot of speculation about the Fed. We turn now to Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, uh, equities look like they're off, but not as much as they were before. But bonds, on the other hand, are selling off. Uh, yeah, we're looking at a sell-off in bonds for sure. We're also looking at a pullback here for stocks, a second down day in a row, at one point the worst day, uh, two days in about three weeks. And I think it has everything to do with that uh, saying we're so familiar with, good news is bad news, because it suggests that maybe the Fed will have to hike more than what the market is pricing in. And it's interesting because the market right now is pricing in one hike for March, sort of one hike for May, and then stopping. They're no longer really uh, pricing in any cuts. Early next year, like, uh, it's not a full cut, but the idea. So we still have this disconnect between the markets and the Fed, but after that blowout jobs report, the big question is, is that going to translate into a renewed push higher for inflation? If it does, at that point, that could really be uh, actual bad news for the markets because it would suggest the Fed's going to have to get a little bit more aggressive than they've indicated. But right now, I think we're just consolidating. NASDAQ 100 up 10 percent this year. You know, rates, they're up, but we're at levels that we've been at and stocks are, are sort of digesting it. So I think we're treading water a little and bit. And does that explain the strength of the dollar, at least today? Well, you know, the dollar is interesting because de technically the dollar is back up on its 50-day moving average. So, or 50, de yeah, 50-day moving average. So after falling about 10 percent from the peak last September, uh, a sharp move up, a sharp two-day move up. And yes, I think it has to do everything with the idea that maybe the Fed's going to be a little bit more aggressive than what the market's pricing in. We do, of course, also have some geopolitical uh, tensions that you've been covering wonderfully uh, this hour. So both of those. But the big question is, if the dollar makes it above the 50-day, that could be also tough for risk assets. Fascinating. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Abigail Dula for, for that report on the markets. Coming up, Russia is back on the offense in eastern Ukraine. We talk with former NATO Deputy Ge Director General Rose Guttemuller. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and we're going to keep you up to date with news from all around the world. For that, we turn to Lisa Mateo here with The First Word. Thank you, David. Some of the most powerful earthquakes in decades hit the Middle East today. And according to the Associated Press, more than 2,300 people have died in Turkey and Syria. The first quake measured 7.7 and ripped across the border between the two countries. The second quake also hit the southeastern part of Turkey and measured 7.5. The quake's force uh, halt in crude oil flows to a regional export terminal. In France, more strikes and protests are planned by unions opposed to President Emmanuel Macron's pension reform proposal. The National Assembly starts debating that measure today. It includes increasing the minimum retirement age from 62 to 64. The U.S. is preparing to ramp up the pressure on Russia as one as one year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine approaches. Bloomberg's learned the Biden administration plans to impose a 200 percent tariff on Russian made aluminum that would effectively end U.S. imports of the metal from Russia. The tariff could be imposed this week. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the U.S. economy is on a path where a recession can be avoided. 
Appearing on ABC, Yellen pointed to January's strong jobs report. Employers added 517,000 jobs last month. Yellen also said that inflation is declining significantly, but is still too high. And companies have announced over 100,000 clean energy jobs in the U.S. since August, when President Biden's climate bill became law. Climate Power, a nonprofit advocacy group, monitor public reports to estimate private sector jobs that aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The group also identified over 90 new clean energy products in 31 states, all announced since Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Lisa. Mm -hmm. We turn our eyes now from China back over to Ukraine, where Russian forces are pressing Ukrainian forces out in the east of the country like they have not for some time. To bring us up to speed on what's going on in Ukraine, the possible consequences, we welcome back now Rose Guttemuller. She's a lecturer at Stanford University. Ms. Guttemuller earlier served as the Deputy Director General of NATO and as Under Secretary of State for Arms Control. So thank you so much for being back with us. What do we know about what appears to be a significant Russian offensive over in the east? It seems like the forces are building up. We've seen Russian pressure against Bakhmut uh, in the Donetsk province for a significant period of time. They claim that they've taken over the town of Solidar. So there has been a very intense Russian pressure. Interesting, it's not only the regular Russian armed forces, but also this uh, so-called Wagner group uh, with the head of Wagner, Prigozhin. Uh, he's involved in all kinds of stunts at the moment, including challenging the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, to an aerial duel in a fighter plane. It's it's bizarre, but mm -hmm. it's uh, all adding up to increased and intensive pressure on Kyiv to be ready for its own uh, spring offensive. And that means, of course, getting Western heavy uh, heavy tanks and other uh, ev other kinds of weapon systems in place. Well, that was my question. There's a lot of talk about the Leopard 2 tank coming from Germany and other NATO countries. Uh, ultimately, below, it's going to take a while, the M1 Abrams. If we could get the Leopard 2 to them faster, would it make a difference in this battle, as far as you understand it? Oh, absolutely. The Ukrainians need to be able to move troops forward and move them forward quickly, uh, protected by armored vehicles, not only tanks, but other kinds of armored personnel carriers. And so it is a, a critical moment. I just saw that Canada has uh, gotten its first Leopard tank over to Poland. That's a good thing, but one tank is not enough. And so I think it's also uh, worth, worth noting that the uh, Ukrainians have already started training on these tanks in Poland, so they are preparing themselves, but the pace of uh, getting the tanks into Ukraine is just going to have to pick up. Uh, Ms. Gautamola, one of the things you and I have talked about in the past is the uh, uh, apparent reform being attempted by President Zelensky with his own government, including with the defense minister. There are reports now, certainly Bloomberg's reporting, that may be put on hold because of this offensive in the east. What's the significance of that if it comes about? Well, the critical point at the at this moment is the fate of the Minister of Defense, uh, Reznikov. He has been the point person talking about getting uh, Western NATO powers to agree and other NATO partners to agree to provide weapons to Ukraine. He has really been a very effective uh, point person and negotiator with regard to that. Next week, there's already another uh, NATO meeting coming up where all the defense ministers get together to talk about aid and assistance to Ukraine, and Reznikov needs to be there. So I I think there are critical reasons why President Zelensky has uh, stepped back from any shakeup involving his minister of defense, but already uh, a deputy minister of defense, uh, a deputy proc uh, proc uh, procurator general, as they call them, chief legal guys, they have also been removed from office and there have been shakeups in, in regional uh, governorships as well. So a lot of shakeups going on uh, below the surface, but I think for the moment, the Minister of Defense will stay in place. Ms. Gautamuller, as I mentioned, when you were at the State Department, you were responsible for arms control issues. And I saw that uh, column that you wrote in the F F Financial Times last week, raising something I had not followed about the New START Treaty. As I understand, the United States has now declared Russia to be out of compliance with that treaty. And I believe it may be the last arms control treaty in effect between the two countries. Is that right? And what's the potential significance of it? 
It is correct, but I want to underscore that Russia remains uh, inside the central limits of the New START Treaty. They are limited to 700 missiles and bombers and 1,550 deployed warheads under the treaty. This is significant. It's a big drop from where they were and where we were, frankly, at the end of the Cold War when we each deployed about 6,000 warheads on strategic uh, intercontinental uh, systems, missile systems and bombers. So it's a big drop and we need to keep them under those limits. They have failed to allow the United States to resume its inspection rights under the treaty. Those inspection rights, both sides agreed to suspend during the COVID pandemic. Now the United States wants to get back to business and the Russians so far have said no, they're trying to link it to their, their concerns about US and NATO involvement in the war in, in Ukraine. But uh, I think it is vital that we keep controlling and limiting those nuclear weapons, especially at a time when uh, President Putin has been rattling the nuclear saber. Well, well certainly it's a, great, a cause of great concern, and we've all been focused on the possible use of a so-called tactical nuclear weapon. There's a different risk here about maybe really doing damage to the arms control uh, structure overall. But right now, is it a practical risk for Russia? I mean, could they, are they in a position to make a lot of nuclear weapons given the, what they're facing in Ukraine? It's interesting about the Russians, no matter what happens, they they keep up their nuclear weapons complex, and they have quite a few weapons that are kept in reserve as well. I mentioned 1,550 weapons deployed, but they have well over 4,000 weapons in their uh, reserves. So uh, they do have the capacity and capability to build more warheads if they needed to. And that's an important point, because that's another reason to keep them limited. They have the capacity to build up a good deal. And so that's why I I think the the emphasis in Washington, President Biden and, and his administration is to try to, first of all, keep the Russians inside the New START Treaty, but also talk about future limitations as well. We are modernizing our nuclear weapon systems, but if possible, we'd like to continue to spend most of our money on conventional forces. Nuclear weapons are not something that you can use on the battlefield. They need to be left on the shelf. They're for nuclear deterrence only. Having been involved directly in this process, is it realistic to expect us to really go after Russia every way we can in conventional weapons in Ukraine and at the same time say, let's make even more progress in nuclear weapons control? It's an interesting uh, question and an important one. It's obviously one Vladimir Putin has, has got front of mind at the moment. But traditionally, even during the depths of the Cold War, we continued to work on nuclear arms limitation and control, despite everything that's gone on elsewhere. I like to recollect that during the Vietnam War, the Soviet at that time were helping the North Vietnamese to shoot down U.S. aircraft over Hanoi. And still we kept working to reduce and eliminate mm. nuclear weapons. So we've got precedents from the past. We treat these nuclear weapons, they are threats to mankind. And so we treat them as an existential threat that needs to be, uh, needs to be reduced and, and limited as much as possible. Thank you so much, Rose. It's always very helpful to be able to talk with you. That's Rose Gottemuller. She's a lecturer at Stanford University. Coming up, and we're going to talk about the politics of the Chinese spy balloon with our political contributors, Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West. And well, that Chinese spy satellite certainly has consequences for the national defense. It also, of course, has consequences for politics. We heard a little bit of that from the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer over the weekend. And the bottom line here is that shooting down the surveillance balloon over water wasn't just the safest option, but it was the one that maximized our intel intelligence payload. I strongly condemn President Xi's brazen incursion into American airspace. To sort out the possible political consequences of all of this, we welcome now back our Bloomberg political contributors, Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano of Iona University. So welcome both of you in Washington. I'm jealous I'm not there with you. We'll get there sooner or later. But OK, Rick, it sounds like uh, the president did it just the right, the right way, except I heard any number of Republicans over the weekend saying, no, 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 it was terrible. No, look, I mean, he, you know, what he said was that he condemns the, the Chinese flyness over U.S. airspace. And so the question is, why did it get into U.S. airspace to begin with? 
Um, <clears throat> we should have shot it down before it even crossed our border, knowing it was on its trajectory to do it. I suspect the Rocky Mountains were a pretty safe place. Uh, and, oh, my God, we're not going to pick up wreckage that we can get off the bottom of the sea. So uh, my view is Republicans were right. This should have never happened. This balloon should have never been allowed to fly over our country, take pictures and exfiltrate data back to the Chinese, regardless of what kind of intelligence opportunity it was for us uh, to try and recover the pieces. So uh, my view is uh, Mark went up for the Republicans. Most people I talked to over the weekend, they had parties around watching the balloon pop. Uh, over and over and over again. Uh, it, it's, it's a very popular thing to think that we don't want Chinese floating balloons over our continental United States taking pictures of our most sensitive uh, military bases. So uh, why anybody thinks allowing that to happen and then shooting it once it got off, uh, off the, uh, uh, the coast uh, was a good idea, I don't know. But if Schumer wants to keep up that line, he, he's running afoul of the public. So, so Jeannie, this is what I'm, I'm genuinely puzzled about. Uh, the Americans uh, tend to do this now regularly, which is when we have a standoff with China, which I would say in this is the, is the, um, is the culprit in the entire incident, we spend all our time accusing one another instead of focusing on Chinese, who, which in this instance at least were sort of the bad guys. So why is that making us safer, Jeannie? You know, I would not think it's making us safer. I think it's part and parcel of our times. I mean, we all remember when politics would end at the shoreline. Those times have clearly gone, and now everything is immediately partisan back and forth, partisan bickering. You know, I think an awful lot of questions remain that the administration, the Pentagon, the military, at some point we need answers to. How many balloons have there been during the Trump administration, before, during the Biden administration? When did they know this balloon was in U.S. airspace. All of those questions remain. That said, I think it's really, really hard to say that the Biden administration had a misstep here. The reality is they shot the balloon down over the ocean when, according to the administration, and again, we need more information, they were told it was safe to do it. But of course, this is going to become an enormously important part of the State of the Union. And you could imagine if the State of the Union was written already, they had to madly rewrite it in light of all that's come out about the balloon. Well, and Rick, it's two years in a row, as I recall. Last year was the invasion of Ukraine that happened on the eve of it. This time it's the spy balloon. So how should the president, how will the president handle it tomorrow night? You know, look, I think he gets past the moment and talks about it in the context of geopolitical relationships, especially with China, right? I mean, like, the world is a dangerous place, and it doesn't take a balloon to tell us that. And so I think this just becomes part of the argument that this administration makes about its dealings with China and, and, and what new era they're working toward, because there's clearly a recalibration of their China policy going on. And, and we won't have the benefit of uh, Anthony Blinken's trip to China to inform the public as to where we stand. So the president's going to have to do that in his State of the Union tomorrow night. And I think it's a very important moment because Americans learned about this balloon from amateur photographers. they got to learn about what our policy is on China from only one man, the president of the United States. So do we know what that policy is and how can he, Jeannie, create that without appearing to go soft on China? You know, I think, you know, it is a fallacy for anybody to discuss the Biden administration as soft on China. For people who have watched for a long time, there is very little sunlight between the Trump administra administration's approach to China and the Biden administration's approach. If anything, he can be accused of the opposite. This is a man who four times as president said the United States military would defend Taiwan if there was a military invasion. That's something that previous presidents have not said. They have joined alliances with a lot of our allies in Asia, you know, this this Great Britain, Australian in terms of the submarine, supporting Jap Japan's massive investment in its military and its move away from its more pacifist sort of approach to foreign policy and military. And of course, just the other day, you had Lloyd Austin in the Philippines saying the United States would now be using nine military bases, some of them very, very close to Taiwan. So I think the administration has got to be very clear that this is a president who has been very upfront about his, you know, bullish approach on China, and he cannot really be accused of being soft on China, despite what Republicans have been saying, if you look at the facts of the situation. If anything, you've got people on the other side saying they are, you know, racking up tensions rather than taking a step to address them when we have an awful lot to deal with on China in terms of the economy, climate, human rights, and everything else. 
Jeannie and Rick are going to stay with us as we look ahead to 2024 and the lay of the land in the presidential race. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.